Hey guys, and welcome to another MODO Compositions tutorial. This is part 26 in the first steps and preparation series. And today we are going to talk about filter nodes in the compositor. So what we need for that is we need some kind of structure in our scene first of all. So let's just add a plane. Okay, let's scale it up a little. Then next thing, I also want to start my sc screen cost keys. Okay, now let's go to 5. So we are in uh, numpad 5 for orthographic view. 1 for front view, Control alt 0 to reposition our camera. Let's just move that one up. Let's RX to move it down a little like this. Uh, maybe a bit less down like so. Now let's just scale along the X axis S and also along the Y axis a little bit. Y like this. Okay. And then let's just apply a texture to that. So let's create a material. Let's go to the texture panel. New clouds. Let's set this, the depth to 7, the size to 0 0.05. Let's uncheck color, let's check normal with point, point 0.5, okay, and that should look something like this. Um, and now let's also make sure that we're not using a point lamp, but a uh, sun lamp. It's a slightly, I always like slightly yellowish color because usually you can just create that effect in the compositor afterwards, but we're not going to um, fiddle with color nodes and so on. So we're going to use this option over here. <clears throat> and that looks like this. Okay. Um, and you can see you get quite easily quite cool results for a floor if you use um, clouds, cloud textures with a high depth value because the, you can see the difference here if you select that and if you go to depth and you turn it down to 2 again and you can see it looks like this and um, that's just uh, like a cheap low quality texture and if you go to, to 7 for example you can see it's much more crisp but if you then go to 10 you can see it's no longer that big of a difference okay you, you'd have to get closer to the to the plane to actually see that Actually, six might, might even be as good. Okay, six is okay as well. Cool. Now we also want it so that this actually uh, creates a sky. I, all, I, I, I really like the skies created by the sun lamp, by the way. I can leave everything else as it is. And you can see... Yeah, cool, why not? Um, maybe one thing to do is to make sure that the horizon color is completely black. Okay. Cool. Now next thing we need is a monkey in here. Okay, like this. Um, let's bring it down. R X forty five minus. Okay, three. Just move that a little bit up here. Cool. Let's make sure it has a subdivision surface on it. A level two, and let's set it to smooth. And let's just bring it a bit closer to the camera. Or yeah, something like that. Okay, and um, now we're also going to set up um, in, an environment lighting and ambient occlusion. Environment environment lighting at 0.3 and ambient occlusion at multiply. Okay, so the environment lighting kind of lightens the scene and the ambient occlusion kind of darkens it. And then we get this, okay, so far so good. Um, now it's a bit too smooth already, okay? We want lower samples, let's go with four samples for now. And you can see the grain starts to appear a bit more and we need that grain because I'm going to show you a method on how to get rid of that grain in the compositor, okay? Cool, let's go with point, point 0.4 here. It doesn't really matter, okay. Now one last thing I'd like to do, I'd like to give this monkey a, 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 a bit of color, so let's just um, go to face select mode, select all those faces, hit Control F, inset faces, this is a new feature with B mesh, then let's just bump the thickness a little bit to around like right there, same goes for over here, Control F, inset faces, and like this, okay, now let's just shift alt select this line, so that then if we're in face select mode, it actually selects the face loop. And now let's just assign them to a new material. So let's create a new material and then again a new material. And let's assign them to over here. And let's just make that like green. I don't know, we have a monkey with green eyes, okay? And then 
same goes for those eyes, uh, for that part of the eyes, plus and black. Okay, cool. Um, and a sign. So this is our monkey. He looks a bit shocked, but that's okay. F12 again. And that's what we get. Cool. Now let's just zoom in a little bit more, actually, even. <clears throat> a little bit. Okay, and since today we're also going to talk a bit about Vector Blur, we already did that in one of the last tutorials, but we can do it again, it's really quite an important node. Let's also give this thing some movement, okay. Um, let's go with, let me see, um, over here, eye location, 100, so let's go to over there, eye location. Cool, so now that moves, and next thing we have to do, let's also give it some rotation, okay. Um, I rotation and then over here we want to go with RC I rotation now let's just hope that somewhere in there we can see him quite well here we go perfect and now what we also need to do we need to go to the render layers and we need to make sure it renders out our vector pass for the speed and our normal pass so we need that for the bilateral blur you can see that's quite a funny note. It doesn't really work perfectly, but it's it's still pretty cool. And anything else? No, that should be all. Okay, so now we can render this scene with F12. Still as unspectacular as before. And now let's just go to the node editor. Let's select compositor, use nodes and backdrop. And now uh, in order to get the viewer node in here, I recently noticed you don't even have to go with shift A output viewer, you can just uh, control shift left click on the node and it automatically adds in your viewer okay by the way control shift left click is usually the combination to connect something to the viewer and apparently in case there's no viewer node in your scene it automatically creates one now unfortunately there are no screencast keys in this mode only in 3d view but i'm sure you can follow along it's not that complicated now with shift a you can add in your nodes and you can see under filter we've got quite a few of them and the one we're going to talk about first is filter, okay? Let's just throw it in here to the viewer and let's see what you can do here. You can see the first method is soften and that just kind of blurs your image. Um, you can see the lower that is, the sharper because uh, it doesn't blur the things and the higher, the softer. Um, this is probably a node I've never used before really because if I want to blur my image, I use a blur node and of course, this is a bit different because you can see, no, it's really not. It just blurs everything a little bit. I don't really know what it's supposed to, supposed to be good for, but it's good to know that you can actually use this one. Okay, now the next thing is much more interesting. It's sharpen. And it just sharpens your image. And you can see it does are quite cool. Of course, factor one is too much, but if you go to point one, you can see everything just becomes a little bit more crisp in a way. If you go to M for mute, you can see the difference is quite amazing I think okay uh, what I usually use this note quite often also in the appetizer series to just give everything a little bit more contrast a little bit more detail okay especially also if you use image textures this is great next thing is Laplace Sobel, Prewitt and Kirsch and they all do a similar similar thing they try to uh, well detect edges it's those are edge detection algorithms okay um, let's just go to one. You can see that's what happens. And um, they all do it a bit differently. And you can see some are quite good at that and some are not so good. I mean, for example, the Kirsch here, it detects way too much in my opinion. Um, up. Yeah, you can see the different. Uh, I, I don't usually use them. You can use them to get a bit of additional um, detail into your scene. You can see at point one, you get some funny results sometimes. This one's a bit extreme. You can see the effect it's having. Um, it's just a filter and not something I usually use either. But I'm sure if you want to create like um, a scene where it only detects the edges or like a cheap, a pretty cheap cartoon scene where you just have a 3D object and it just uh, renders out the edges, maybe you can use that for that. I don't know. I usually don't use it, but uh, anyway. And then finally there's shadow. And this kind of tries to detect shadows and you know, uh, separate them from the rest. So, um, 
Yeah, not something I usually use, but if you put that at point one, for example, you can see it just gives also a little bit more detail, okay? What I don't like is that it looks as if there's bump mapping on the shadow, okay? As if the shadow um, is like uh, printed, stamped in there. It looks a bit weird, but you can see the effect it's having. Okay, so let's just leave leave that at sharpen point one. It actually improves the image. Maybe that's already too much. Uh, if you have like a photograph and you just want to process it in Blender, just go with something lower than point one. Anyway, this is our sharpen node. Next thing we have is blur. Okay, and uh, let me just put that over there. We don't really need it right now. And what blur does is quite self-explanatory. It just blurs your image. Okay, and um, <coughs> you can see a couple of options here. First of all, we have a type. There are different ways to blur your image, okay? For example, um, flat kind of... Um, well, blurs them in a flat way. It's kind of hard to explain. But then we have fast Gaussian, which kind of blurs everything quite evenly. Then we have also Catram and Mitch, and they kind of try to consider dark and bright areas, and they don't, um, they don't really blur them the same way and then some other ways and you can play with those they're pretty fun uh, next thing is bokeh this is just um, a way to force blender to use a circular filter i'm not really sure what that is but it's supposed to give you higher quality blurs okay and once again i have no idea what a high quality blur is as opposed to a low quality blur in my opinion with bokeh it doesn't look better than without bokeh okay so and it's really uh, processing time intense it takes a lot of time to process and it's really not necessary in my opinion so usually you don't want to use that this is a gamma correction um and if you use that and it kind of blows out the, the highlights a little bit okay can sometimes be quite cool it, it gives you a slightly more realistic result in some cases um yeah i'd say check it out next thing is relative and you can see right now we have x, y, 0. Now if we improve that to 1, you can see everything gets blurred a little. And that is by 1 pixel in each direction. If you go to 10 and 10, you can see it's 10 pixels in each direction. Okay. Now if we check relative, then instead of in, in pixels, you, you um, type in the values in percent. Okay. Problem here is if we blur everything um, at 10%, in the width and in the height, then we have the problem that the height is not quite as big, uh, as 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 long as the width, and therefore we get an aspect ratio problem. If you go to ten percent here, and ten percent here, you can see. Okay, that's too much. Let's go with two percent and two percent. You can see it's it, it blurs it uh, more intensely on the y-axis because um, the y-axis is longer. Now we can correct that. We can go with aspect correction on the y. So now both. Um, axes are getting blurred according to the length of this side or with x okay you can see there's a significant difference in the amount of blur okay um yeah or none which is then again the same thing uh cool now let's say we have blurred by two percent and now let's say we activate bokeh after all you can see it takes quite some time but the quality is a bit higher apparently um the problem with the flat filter is that it kind of creates those um those square looking things it's kind of hard to describe but you can see everything is like a little bit like blurred according to boxes or something and with bokeh it just looks differently not better really so the flat blur is not really cool in my opinion let's stay with relative two percent okay now what else do we have let's go with catram and this is one of my favorite blurs it blurs everything a bit more uh, in, a, in a bit more subtle way and still preserve some of the detail, although it is blurred. It's kind of cool. If you compare that to, let's say, the Mitch, then you can see um, quite a different result. Okay, uh, come on. Oh, that as opposed to oh, uh, relative. Okay, here we go. You can see the dark areas are more um, get uh, getting away less blurred than than the bright areas with the Catram as opposed to the Mitch. Okay, and then once again, shifty, let's go with a fast Gaussian. And this one really just blurs everything evenly. Okay, um, you can see it's also 5% as for the other ones, but the blur is quite different. Okay, and that's because it doesn't really consider bright and dark areas. Okay, at least I think that's why it is. And then we have the next one, which is, for example, um, 
let's go with cubic and it is not even so important to know how they react just play with them and usually um if you make an animation or something the view does not even have time to distinguish between the different blur types okay but you can just see the differences and i think i, I like catrum quite a lot also fast gaussian because it's really well fast and it just does a great job to blur everything evenly and then cubic just is something in between the others cubic is probably quite simple to match no not really either okay so yeah let's just delete them again except for one let's just move that to over here now the next blur uh is, is a bit weird it's called directional blur and it is um well it gives a directional blur to an image okay you can basically use it to create mo or to fake motion in a still image that has already been rendered if you don't want to use or can't use motion blur or vector blur or something the way it works is quite simple first we have the iterations which decides how uh, in how much how many steps it is blurred okay the, the higher the iterations um the more accurate or the more the smoother your blur appears then we've got the center this is the center for the rotation okay if you want to rotate the image and then we come to the significant parts distance angle spin the distance tries to fake how far your image basically travels in a certain amount of time okay so the higher this is uh the stronger the blur so let's go with point one for now and you can see um i don't know if you know that from cameras but they have a shutter speed and the shutter speed is kind of uh, the time on how long the lens is open or how long light is received from the environment and the longer the period of time is, the more blur um, appears because an object that's actually moving during the time has more time to cast light rays onto the, um, the sensor, okay? So in this case, um, the higher that is, the, the stronger the blur, okay? But you can see it's very low quality right now, and if we bump up the iterations, more and more steps are added, and that looks actually as if it's really blurred in a very fast way, okay? And that actually looks as if the uh, the whole image, or, or actually the viewer with the camera, is moving very fast relative to the scene. Okay, And now if you change the center here, you can see not, nothing happens, because it's just not relevant. Also, if you change the angle, you can see it's now dragged to over there, but once again, the center doesn't make a change. Okay. By the way, 0.5 is the center. Okay, So this is 0, this is 0.5, this is 1. And then I think this is 0, this is 0.5, and this is 1. So this is... Right now the center is over here. And now this is just for um, blurring to one direction. But you can also spin your image, okay? Let's put that back to 0 and that back to 0. And now let's just spin it by 20 degrees. You can see that's what happens. And you can see now th the center is over here. And if you go to 1 over here, you can see it's over there. Or you can go to 0, then it's over here. Okay, and you can go to 1 over there. And then you can see it's up there, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, but then you can also see one other problem. Um, because it spins the, the, the whole image, it starts to draw in the black from outside the image, in a way, okay? And you can get rid of that by clicking Wrap. And what it does right now, it just um, uses basically this part over here. Or, oh no, this part over here that gets blurred... Um, outside the image and just adds it in over here and it doesn't really work so well okay uh, you can clearly see that there's a there's a, like a border there there's a problem and yeah it just doesn't really work that well you can also combine the two blur methods you can also also increase the distance you can see that's what you get um, and you can play with the angles and you get all sorts of effects that are quite cool on a still image but on an animation you can really you cannot really use that in any way okay so this is your directional blur. The next thing is bilateral blur. Now this is an interesting thing. Um, with the bilateral blur, you can blur an image, okay, or, or, or an object or something, without um, blurring the edges, okay. So in this case, let's just take a clo close look at the monkey. You could blur this part, okay, so that you would no longer see the grain from the ambient occlusion and the environment lighting. But it would stop blurring over here because it would notice, ah, here's an edge, okay, and I want to keep this edge, okay. It would also blur this part and this part separately, but there would be no blur over this edge, okay. And it's a method to clean up your object renders. It um, gets rid of the noise from the uh, ambient occlusion or from 
ray tracers, unbiased ray tracing engines like Cycles, although I think it's not 100% unbiased. Anyway, yeah, but of course this is a method to fake um, smoothness and it doesn't work 100%. So if you just drop that in there, you can see it starts to become more uh, blurred. Let's go with iterations of 5, which is quite a lot. And you can see you have a pretty clean monkey, but uh, it also blurs some things you don't want. You can see it doesn't blur this edge, but it does blur this one, and it blurs it over here, and everything gets blurred a little. But you can also see around the ears, there's a clean edge there, and yeah. So that didn't really work so well. Now, if you change the, uh, the color sigma, okay, so this is the amount of blur, and the color sigma is kind of... Uh, the amount of difference you need between pixels to consider them an edge, okay? So if we lower that, then we get more accuracy, okay? So let's go with 0.1. And you can see now nearly all the edges are being considered, but it's kind of bumpy and messy and the eyes are still blurred and we, we, get just, we, get, we just get some issues here, okay? And the, finally, this is spacing, but this is a fine-tune option for the, the blur radius, okay? If that is low, you can see nothing's blurry if that is high, then everything appears more blurry. Okay, just the blur is stronger, but it doesn't really change anything on the way the edges are being detected. Now, over here we have a determinator, okay? And um, we can now use an, a, a different image, and then this first input is used as the image to be processed, okay, the output, and the second one is just used to detect the edges, okay? And one way you can use that the second one is to use a mix node, filter, color, mix node. Set this to add. And then let's take the normal pass. Like this, okay. And now let's add the C pass onto that. With a value of 0.1 for now. Uh, 0.2 maybe. 0.15. Okay, cool. And now we use that um, as a determinator. And you can see... Everything is much cleaner now. If we take that out, that's what it looks like. And if we put that in, you can see a much more, a much cleaner um, blur we get here. Problem now is that it all didn't consider the eyes. Okay, so you have to do something separately for the eyes. You could, for example, use um, a mask. Yeah, you could use a. Uh, let's just do that. Let's just try this with 3D view. Let's go to materials. Select this material actually. Let's go to also this one. So let's go to select this one down here. Let's set this to one pass index of one. Let's select this one. Let's go to a pass index of two. Let's go to over here. Let's check material index under the render layer properties. Let's render that again. No editor. Okay, now let's just shift A. Converter ID mask. Okay. One, shift D. Two. Let's use that on there and that on there. A color mix. Here we go. This is actually all true, could already do the trick. Yeah, you can see now it's no longer blurred. Um, we want to smooth those masks. And now we actually get a monkey that is evenly blurred and looks much smoother than the beginning result, okay? You can see like this. Now you probably want to work on those edges, like blurring the different inputs a little bit to get a cleaner result, but you can see what it does. According to the determinator, according to that, it actually blurs the image without um, messing with the edges. And this we actually get a quite a clean, cool result. Um... Yeah, anyway, let's just uh, move that to actually over there as well. Okay, so the next uh, node would be the vector blur. This is something we already know about. We just need to take a look at it again. Okay, so first input is the image to be processed. Second input is C pass. This is the depth pass to see what pixel is how far away from the camera. And the third one is the actual speed of the vertices. Okay. Connected to your final, to your um, viewer, and you can see we get this kind of motion. 
first of all, we have kind of a, a rotation and also a, a bit of a translation, okay? Because it, the, the monkey actually moves and rotates at the same time. Now, um, in this case, we should see a difference between curved and uncurved. But let's let's start on the top. First are the samples, okay? You can see if we zoom in a little bit here. I'm going to see it so well right now. Let's go with 10. Those steps, okay? And those are the samples. The higher the samples, the smoother your blur. Okay, so 32 is pretty smooth already. You can also go with 64, which is just a bit smoother, or even higher, but 64 is quite okay. Second thing is the blur, okay? The bigger that number, the higher uh, the amount of blur. Let's go with 5, and you can see that's a lot of blur. This monkey is spinning really, really fast. You can also see it becomes a bit inaccurate uh, if the, the values are higher, okay? So, yeah, but it's too much anyway. So 1 is perfectly fine, or even a bit lower if you want, whatever. Now speed, minimum and maximum speed. Okay, so the minimum speed is kind of like um, the starting point f for your blur, okay? Um, if if a certain pixel is faster than this minimum speed, it gets blurred, otherwise it doesn't get blurred, okay? But not just that, this kind of raises the bar for all the pixels, okay? So if you have like a pixel, let's set this to 5. You can see everything is, uh, actually 20, this is not enough, 20. You can see everything is blurred less now, and that's because um, it blurred all the pixels, and then if we say 20, then 20 is the minimum it needs to be blurred, but also everything above 20, that is faster, kind of gets 20 subtracted from it in a way, I think you can explain it this way, and therefore there is less speed left, and therefore it gets blurred less, okay. And the maximum speed is quite self-explanatory. The lower that, the lower your maximum speed. If you set it to 20, you can see it just comp compresses the whole range in a way, okay? And everything gets blurred less and less and less and less. Until finally there's no blur left at all. Okay. And also if you set it to zero, then there's it's not, not no blur, but it's just um it just doesn't use this function at all. That's also you can see maximum speed or zero if, for none. Now this one is actually quite this seems actually quite good to display the next thing that's curved, okay? Um, let's take a look at our monkey. Let's go to top view. Now if we scrap, uh, scrap through this timeline, you can see it's like this, and then it's like this, like this, like this. This is not a smooth a smooth movement, okay? It's, it's in steps, okay? So basically, um, it moves from one step to another in one in one step, of course, and therefore the blur would be quite jacked in a way, okay? If you would imagine a blur line, it would be like duck, 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 and that's not so cool. What you can do, you can check curved, and then it interpolates between the frames in a Bezier curve, okay? And the Bezier curve kind of, uh, yeah, smooth everything out, so then this would no longer be duck, 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 but it would be a smooth line, okay? It, it's a very subtle change, but uh, it doesn't really take a lot of processing time, so I think that's okay. This is your vector blur. Uh, let's just cut that out as well. We need it later on because I want to show you a technique to combine depth of field and vector blur, but that's in just a second. Th so the next thing we want to talk about is dilate erode. And this is quite funny, okay? So um, thank God we have this index... Uh, mask right now. Let's say we want to change the color of the black part of this eye, okay? So what you would do, you'd just, for example, use a mix node. You would mix in white, and then you would use this as a factor. And then you would use a ID mask to select the right part of the eye, let's say a one. Like this, okay? This is smooth. But you can see right now, let's say we want red eyes, it doesn't really work so well because there is this border, okay? So the mask we have over here doesn't really have the right size, okay? So now we can use dilate road. What that does, it scales up or down the, the, the bright part of the image, okay? So the higher that is, the bigger they become. The lower that is, the smaller they become. That was too low. Okay, they become smaller and smaller and smaller. And this way you can adjust masks or other things or whatever you want. So let's change it to one. Actually, you can see now it actually works. Of course, this is not a very clean way. There are other ways to do that, but this one actually works as well. And now we can 
according to this mask, add in something or subtract something or multiply it or whatever you want, okay? And yeah, that's just a way to, one way to adjust masks is just to dilate a road node, okay? And it's pretty cool. You can use it for a lot of things. We, for example, use it in the appetizer series to, to fake caustics, okay? You kind of use the shadow of a glass that it's, the shadow that a glass throws onto a table, then you kind of uh, erode it, and then you kind of get something that looks a bit simi similar to uh, caustics, and you can then use that too in the compositor. Um, yeah, it's usually used for masks. You can see it also says mask over here. And it's just awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, one other important thing is if you want to combine masks, okay? So let's say you want to combine this mask. And let's also say, just duplicate that to, again, Shift A, Color Mix. You want to mix those together. You can do that by, for example, going like this. And then you can see you get that. Now you combine those masks because you, you, you use the upper mask and then according to the lower mask, you can see the factor, you add it in the lower mask and then you get this result. And um, yeah, uh, it doesn't work really because of this, uh, this gap here. And here you can just easily put that in there and problem solved. Oh, this is the wrong one. I'm sorry. I need to put that in there and that in there. Like so. Um, let me just see. Ah, I'm sorry. We also need to on the top input like this. Then a bit break even. And you can see now it's perfectly white. Okay, so this way you can adjust masks, for example. You can see there's a, a slim border here. So what I would do, I would go with add. And then the problem now is that it's probably a buff one at some places. And then you have to bring that down with a, a, a converter a vector map value. No, let me just see. Um, use minimum one. That didn't really work as so well. There you can see. Now we offset everything by minus one, which means everything brighter than one is displayed. You can see there's still this ring. And that's because we added white onto white and therefore we get this... Um, area that's brighter than two and if we just now check go back to zero and if now if you check um use maxi maximum which just cuts off everything above one then you can now use this mask okay because previously let me just display it. if you use that as a mask you get this you can get this extra red problem here this problem zone now if we use this one that cuts off everything above one you can see problem solved okay a bit confusing here but we are using this method also in one of the next tutorial series, actually. I'm not sure if you've seen it, the one with the cubes. Uh, yeah, we'll talk more about that then. J2 over here.